we're going to talk about smoother sailing, navigating care on a budget. Now, a lot of people hear the word budget and they might think, actually, I'm doing pretty good. I have a pretty good job or I've retired from a pretty good job. I have a decent amount of assets. Or others here might be saying, thank God the word budget because I am really having some challenges. But the truth is, the word budget is so important to everybody who's aging or everybody who's caring for an older loved one. Pretty much, unless you're aging like Oprah. <laughs> Oprah probably doesn't need to hear this presentation. Or if you are Warren Buffett and you need caregiving someday, his family and friends probably don't need to hear this presentation. But really, for the rest of us, even if you have a decent amount of assets, maybe you own a home, maybe you have a, a good job, uh, maybe you've got lots of people in your family that, that are, are well off, and it also extends to those of us who maybe aren't as financially prosperous. So unless you're in the stratosphere of Oprah or Warren Buffett or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg, we all need information like this, navigating care on a budget. This program today is, I know we have professionals here, but we have the rest of the group is either family members taking care of a loved one, or you're simply an older adult yourself and you want to make sure that you're able to arrange care for yourself that doesn't make you go bust, right? You want to be able to keep as much money as you can and get the services that you need. And that's what today is all about. So we're going to do the presentation and then we're going to open it up for a dialogue because we want everybody to get what they need as in a cost effective way as possible. Caregiving. Caregiving for a loved one, a mom, an uncle, uh, a neighbor, anybody that you might be caring for is no vacation. Aging itself is no vacation, but getting care can be done in a more cost-effective way. So we're going to remember today the acronym BUDGET. BUDGET. B, build a crew. You, we want to understand the entire financial picture that we're working with before we do anything. D, we don't want to rule out any options. G, we want to get connected with nonprofit and government organizations that can help us. You all in the audience, or those of you maybe watching, you are already one step ahead because you're connected here today with the Queen Anne's County Department of Aging, right? So that is a wonderful thing. You're connected with them at very least. And there's other organizations here that you're connecting with too. But we're gonna talk about other organizations that can help you. Elder law attorney, almost everybody who has any assets, and I'm talking if you own a home that's worth even $100,000, which most homes are worth more than that these days, you probably will benefit and save money if you seek the services of an elder law attorney. And we're going to talk about why. So seeking the services of an elder law attorney. And then finally, trial offers trying out different services can help save you money. So this is going to be our acronym for this morning's presentation, budget. Now we're going to go into great detail about each of those. So first one is build a crew. I wrote a book called Cruising Through Caregiving. All of the analogies have to do with boating. I'm a boater. I'm actually the world's worst first mate. I promise you my husband will verify that. Uh, anybody else a boater? Anybody else enjoy getting out on the water? Okay, so you might, you might appreciate some of these analogies we're gonna talk about, but I'm gonna talk to you about building a caregiving crew, whether it's for yourself or for the loved one that you're taking care of, whether you're taking care of a mom, a grandparent, uh, a friend of the family, you're gonna build a crew. So a solid caregiving crew, I'm gonna liken to a boating crew. Everybody knows, I'm looking around the room, everybody knows if you're a boater, there can only be one captain. The captain of the caregiving crew 
is actually the primary caregiver. So if you need care, maybe your daughter is the one that helps out the most, and she would be considered the caregiving captain. Or maybe it's your grandson, he helps out the most, and he's considered the captain of the caregiving ship. You want to have a couple of first mates, one or two first mates. We all know that you can dock a boat, just the captain, but my gosh, when it is a windy day, aren't you so glad when somebody else is helping tie up that boat? That's what we want. We want the secondary caregivers to be folks that are your first mates. And then we want to have lots of dock hands. Usually, we all know if we're out boating, you're lucky you got, you got one person on the dock that's helping pull in the boat. But what we want, everybody who's aging, and everybody who's taking care of a family member or a friend, we want you to have lots of dock hands. So what are those people gonna do? They're gonna be what we call your tertiary caregivers. So the primary caregiver, who's the captain of the caregiving ship, remember, we're still on B. This is, before we get into anything else, you're building your crew. Who is going to help? Who's gonna be part of your team? If you like the word team better than crew primary caregiver is going to be the captain of the ship. So what does that person do? So if you're taking care of, say, your husband, maybe your husband's got some health healthcare issues. Maybe you're the wife, you're in charge, you're doing most of the work. And so you, what do you want to look at yourself if you're taking care of issues that your husband has? Maybe you're the one that runs him to doctor's appointments. Maybe you have to help him out in the bathroom sometimes. Maybe you're cooking most of his meals. You want to start looking at yourself as a captain, as somebody who gives out delegation, orders to other people. Obviously you wanna do it politely, but you wanna be giving out others on the caregiving crew orders. You're gonna be telling the, the dock hands what to do. You're gonna be telling the first mates what to do. Sadly, what we see the majority of the time is that people only have a caregiving captain. Can anybody relate that maybe Right, that you're the only one doing everything. And I recently worked with a woman who said, I couldn't possibly allow anybody else to help out with what's going on with my husband. He would never allow that. He only wants me. A lot of people can relate to that. And if you are the older adult, maybe, that others are helping out with, Maybe you're sitting here in the audience and you're thinking, gosh, I have said that to my husband or I have said that to my daughter. It's a very common phenomenon that somebody who needs a little extra help or maybe needs a lot of help, they only want that one person. They got comfortable with whoever it is, their wife, their daughter, whoever it is. But typically, caregiving experiences last for a while. Now, when I was taking care of my grandmother-in-law who died of cancer, I spent six weeks, and so did a lot of folks in our family, when she was at ends of life, we put our lives on hold, okay? And we worked with hospice, and we took care of her until she passed away. It was six weeks, though. You can do that when it's six weeks. You can have one or two people involved when it's six weeks. But how many of us in this room have been helping out a loved one, or maybe you yourself have been dealing with health struggles for six years? Sometimes caregiving can be long. Sometimes it's 16 years. So that's why we always want there to be one captain who can delegate, who can decide what, do, what does our loved one need? What do we need in order to make this person's quality of life better and that's what we're going to share. We're gonna share ideas and we're gonna share tasks that, that other people can do that will support the caregiving crew, that will support the person that needs help, but will also support that person, that the, rest, the caregiving captain. Because the caregiving captain burns out. If you're a caregiving captain, you've probably had the experience where you've had days and moments where you feel like you cannot do it anymore if you don't have a solid crew. So we're still on building the crew. Second, we want to have first mates. We want, these are gonna be your secondary caregivers. So secondary caregivers are gonna do items to support not just the person who needs help, but they're gonna do tasks and activities that are gonna be really supportive to the captain. So 
what kinds of things might that involve? So I worked with a family once who the mom, the wife, is the caregiving captain for the husband who has Alzheimer's disease. And she finally acquiesced and said, you know what, I do need to let some people help. So she's allowing her daughter occasionally to take the father to doctor's appointments. She's giving herself a break. She's also allowing sometimes her granddaughter to stay with her grandfather the husband, when she wants to go out for a walk with a friend or go get a manicure, do something for herself. So the first mates are not just supporting and taking care of and doing tasks for the person that may be ill, but they're also doing some nice things for the captain. Who wouldn't want that? Why are people so resistant to this concept? Because as a rule, in almost 30 years of working in this field, it is across the board one of the hardest sells that I have to make, that you need to have a crew. Again, this is going to save you money in the long run, but it's also going to save you time and it's going to save you energy. So secondary caregivers, you're going to have your first mates. Then you want to have lots of dock hands. And again, if you're a boater, you know that when it's a really windy day and you know you shouldn't have taken your boat out, when you get to the marina and you see a dock hand, you are so grateful, aren't we? We're so happy when we see a dock hand there. Oh, good, I don't have to, it's not just the two of us that have to pull the boat in. That's what we want for the caregiving crew. We want to have people that are able to pull you in when you need help. So typically what the tertiary caregiver or the dock hand is going to do is they're going to do nice things for the captain to make the situation easier. Now let me give you an example. I worked recently with a family over the summer that one of the things that they did was they explained that to the, the, all of their neighbors were very, very worried about them because they said, you guys have been, um, it's a husband and wife situation. It seems like you guys never come out of your house anymore. Is everything okay? They've been uh, living near their neighbors for over 20 years. And it turns out that the husband is taking care of the wife who has a number of issues, health issues. She's got congestive heart failure. She's diabetic. They're not leaving the house that much anymore. And what they finally came up with was one of the neighbors decided that they are going to every time that they go to the grocery store, they're going to pick up groceries for this couple. Now the couple is going to pay for it, right? They're going to give them money and reimburse them for the groceries. But this is something that they don't have to worry about now. Another example that I worked with recently was somebody started realizing that the lawn was overgrown in their neighborhood for a neighbor. And that neighbor said, you know what, I'm going to have my teenage kid do your lawn now. And that was a help for the captain. We're not saying that the dock hands, now you don't necessarily want your neighbors or your friends from church or uh, maybe your great grandchildren, we don't really want them giving medicine to the patient, the person that needs care, right? We don't want them taking them to the doctor. We don't want them helping out in the bathroom. That would probably be really awkward. If they're, if they're friends, but they're not super close friends, or they're neighbors or friends from church or temple or synagogue, but what can they do to make your quality of life easier? That's what we're talking about. Can, will you, what will you accept from them? So what we're going to do in a little while is we're, I bet there's people here that are saying to themselves, oh, this sounds great, but I don't have people like that. How many people are thinking that? It sounds so great, but there's nobody like that in my life. Yes, another lament that we constantly hear from older adults and their family caregivers. I'm going to teach you how to do it this afternoon, this morning, sorry, this morning. I'm going to teach you how to do it this morning. We have an exercise that we're going to give out to everybody, and we're going to teach you how to find free help in your network and how to build a solid caregiving crew of people that you aren't thinking of. So we're going to get to that a little bit later. So in forming the crew, one of the best and most important concepts is you, I want you to start thinking about you're going to ask the right person for the right thing. Now, I am not a fabulous cook. I get by. I'm able to bake chicken. I'm able to boil pasta, 
the fancy stuff that is eaten in my house is prepared by my husband. Anything that's really, really good, Sean makes. But I can, I can cook, so I'm not gonna, if, if somebody is a caregiver in my neighborhood or a friend is taking care of their mother, and they say to me, Jennifer, hey, uh, we really need help with, we need somebody to bring a meal once a month or once a week. I am gonna cringe. You don't wanna ask me to bring the meal. Actually, ask me to sit with your mother while you go out and do something fun for yourself. Maybe while you go golfing. Maybe while you go uh, you, you take care of something that your kids need. Ask me or ask me to bring a meal. I'm happy to bring a meal. Just don't ask me to make the meal. If you're looking for homemade, you don't want to ask me for that. So you got to be thinking about your network of friends and family. You want to be asking the right person for the right thing. Now there's a lot of people in your family when, when you start and your friend network that you start looking at and you're thinking, gosh, that person is really good with money or really good with internet skills or they're really good with household chores. Maybe those are the sorts of things that they'd be willing to do to help support you. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later in the session. For those of you who, again, I know, and I, some people raise their hands, some people, I really appreciate the people that raise their hands and say, yeah, this isn't realistic for me, because there's a lot of people. I'm sure the folks that raise their hands are just a small percentage of the people that say, yeah, th I, this isn't gonna work for me. But I want you to think about, if you are the only captain of the caregiving ship, or if you're an older adult who really could use some help, but you're not asking for it, I want you to consider who are you excluding from your care? Who are you excluding from your life now that maybe you have some health issues? Dr. Ann Morrison, who works with my company, Generations Health, and she's quoted uh, in Cruising Through Caregiving, the book that I wrote, I have 24 people that I interviewed, 24 healthcare professionals, and Dr. Morrison uh, was a professor at Johns Hopkins for a really long time. And she, one of the things that she always said to families was, who are you excluding? Because oftentimes you'd be surprised, people want to help you. They feel like they don't know how. We've got a lot of women here today. How many have been to a baby shower? Yeah, okay. Men, sorry, you, actually I'm not sorry, you're probably lucky that you get out of going to showers. <laughs> go to a baby shower, and once the baby's here, everybody knows what to do. What do we do? We offer to babysit. We bring a gift. We might bring a box of diapers, or we bring some formula, or we, we bring a gift card or, or food, so that way the, the new mom and, and the new family, they don't have to worry about cooking for a while. Everybody knows what to do. Or we come over and give mom a rest so she can take a nap. Everyone knows what to do when there's a new baby. When there's an older loved one in the family who's struggling maybe with cognitive or mental health issues or health, physical health problems, people don't know what to do. We haven't made that paradigm shift in our society yet that everybody says, oh, you know what, I need to offer help. So if somebody has offered you help once and you've said, nope, I'm fine, oh, we don't need anything, they may be really reluctant to offer it again. So keep that in mind, and we're gonna talk a little bit more of that in the session. So we're still on B of budget, build a caregiving crew. We need a captain, primary caregiver. We need first mates, who are your secondaries, and we need lots of dock hands. Build a caregiving crew. Understand the entire financial picture. I know that there's a lot of older adults, especially if you're an older than a baby boomer, if you're what we call a traditionalist, you are really reluctant typically to talk about your money. Now the millennials, they, they'll throw it up on Facebook and Instagram. This is what I made last year, right? This is what I paid for a house. There, there's a lot more open-mindedness with sharing what you have in terms of resources when, the, when you go to the younger generations. But the, especially the traditionalists, they're a little bit uncomfortable, or perhaps, possibly in some cases a lot uncomfortable saying what they have. You cannot start the process until you know what the financial picture looks like. And I'm not just talking about the older person who might need help. 
So if you are an older adult that wants to get care on a budget, you've got to be open and honest with professionals that you're working with, legitimate professionals. So people from the area agency that are trying to see if you're qualifying for something, or if you're working with a trusted financial planner or accountant, or you're, you trust a son or daughter or a niece. I'm talking about people that you trust, not a stranger that you just met, but you've really got to be open. So older adults who, who want to work with loved ones and try to do care on a budget and work with professionals, you got to be open. You got to be able to share. I'm not saying you give everybody your account numbers, but you got to be sharing. Those of you who are caregivers, you have got to get that information from your loved one. You have to, because you need to know what comes in every month, what goes out every month, where are the assets, what are the assets, how much are they worth. Then what we're looking at is we're looking at our crew. So once we're looking, we're starting with the person who needs care, right? So what do they, what is their social security? Do they have a pension? What other types of assets or income do they have stocks do they have bonds do they have what what other what other resources do they have financially but then you want to look at the caregiving crew and i'm going to give you an example of a, a person who was a caregiver uh, for her mom she was doing the primary caregiving and it turns out that they they really wanted to place mom in a a small assisted living that wouldn't be overly expensive but they were falling short a little bit of money. And what they found is that one of the nephews who lives kind of far away, he inherited some money from his mother who, when she died, who is this, uh, this aunt, an aunt, the, the aunt of, so we, uh, let, me, let me start over. So we've got, <laughs> excuse me, I'm gonna get, I'm get, we've got a lot of moms and aunts and, and nephews here. Okay, so we've got mom who is, they want a place in a small assisted living. It wasn't gonna be too expensive, but it was a little bit more than what the mom could afford. And what they found out is that there was a nephew who his mom had passed away a few years before. And that was the sister of mom. And what he'd been doing since his mother had passed away, the, the sister of the person that needed care that we wanted to place in the assisted living group, what happened there was he had been sending her $300 a month. And just because he felt that that's something that his mother would want for his sister. So that was a $300 a month that the family didn't really know about. And they thought, okay, great, this is something that we can add. Now, we don't always have wonderful surprises like that, right? But, but you've gotta really look and you've gotta ask those questions. There sometimes are money and assets that you don't know about. Sometimes there are assets in the family that everybody thinks that the whole family knows about, but people don't know about it. It's not common knowledge. So you gotta look at the financial picture. And I'm gonna say, for those who are older adults here that are looking to do care on a budget, you've got to put your pride aside if you need care and some of the family members want to uh, help out financially. Some family members are gonna be willing and able to pitch in a little bit. Say you need a home care aid and say you, that you just don't have enough to have the 10 hours a week that you really are gonna benefit from. You've gotta consider if other family members are willing to do that. In my family, when my grandma needed help, our entire, there were 11 of us. We, what we came up with was everybody over 30, all of the adults in the family, were gonna contribute something every month for home care. My grandmother hated this, but the way that we pitched it to her was, well, it's giving all of us a break. As much as you might not like for us to pitch in a couple of hundred dollars each month, we're getting a little bit of a break and we feel like it's a good financial investment. So before you make any decisions, before don't go out and look and select an assisted living or a group home or a home care agency or don't buy or sign up for anything until you're aware of the financial picture. Because another thing that I see happen with families is they make assumptions of what they can and cannot afford. So look at the financial picture. Don't rule out any option. People make assumptions all the time, we can't afford that. Or mom would never do that. You may be surprised when you say to a loved one on a scale of one to 10, 
how likely are you to allow help into the home? Zero or one being never, 10 being very ready. A lot of families underestimate that the person who may need care, the older adult, realizes that it's not working out perfectly right now. Don't say, never say never. I have a whole chapter in Cruising Through Caregiving that says don't make promises. If you make a promise that we'll never use home care, we'll never use assisted living, we'll never allow any strangers into the home, I will always be the one to do everything for you. You are setting yourself and your loved one up for a major disappointment. So don't rule out any option. Whether it be something that, accepting, I, I've heard families say, we will never use Medicaid. Medicaid is for really poor people, and we worked our whole lives. Sometimes Medicaid makes a lot of sense. Getting Medicaid and utilizing that for adult daycare, utilizing that for nursing home services, uh, you, and using it for, uh, for a lot of different programs that are out there right now makes a lot of sense. And so sometimes people rule themselves out of what they think is an expensive option, like an assisted living or, oh gosh, only rich people can afford Regent Home Care or Home Instead or, right? But, but honestly, sometimes it's going to be more cost effective than you think. Also, don't assume that certain programs, you're above them. So don't rule out any option that's on the table. Get connected with a nonprofit and government agencies. This is one of the most important tasks that I'm going to assign to everybody. If you have any kind of health, mental health, cognitive issue, there is a nonprofit out there that specializes in what you need. If you're here today, this is great. This is perfect because you're connected with the Area Agency on Aging. This is awesome. Anybody not a Queen Anne's resident, anybody from a different county, well, guess what? You have an area agency there also. If you want to know, you guys have Upper Shore Aging at Caroline. Uh, every single county in the US has an area agency on aging. Make a friend there. Today, this is, make a friend. There's a lot of staff from your area agency here today. Get to know somebody, make a friend there. In addition to government agencies, you also should probably call your health department your Department of Social Services. What services do you offer for people in my situation or my, my loved one's situation? So government, you're already connected with a government organization. This is great. And if you've signed in here, you're probably on their mailing list, which is terrific. You're going to learn. You're going to be the first ones to know about programs and services that are available. But nonprofits, nonprofits are so important. So I worked for a very long time with the Alzheimer's Association. And I'm going to tell you a little story that is probably going to blow a lot of people's minds. So Alzheimer's Association, along with Upper Shore Aging, which took care of, which still takes care of Talbot, Caroline, and Kent counties, they're the area agency for there. For three years, back in the mid 2000s, for three years, they had a program called the Rose Grant. Anybody ever hear of that, the Rose Grant? Okay, it wasn't in Queen Anne's County, so you may not have heard of it. But the Rose Grant was a partnership between Alzheimer's Association, the local area agency on aging, which was Upper Shore Aging, it was for these three counties, and it was funded by the Maryland Department of Aging. If you were a caregiver for somebody who had any type of dementia, you could get $1,500 a year for three years. If you were a caregiver for somebody with dementia, you could get $1,500 every year for three years. What was the criteria? I would sit down with somebody and I would say, listen, this is a great program. You're caring for your mom. She has Lewy body dementia. Let's apply for this. It was a one-page application. It did not ask how much money you had how much money you make, doesn't ask how much money your mom has. It says, does your loved one have dementia? What is her name? What is your name? Where do you want the check to go? I worked with families who would not fill this application out because they thought there was a catch. I will tell you that the end of this program, I'm pretty certain that money was sent back because not enough people took it. The only criteria 
The only criteria was you had to live in one of those three counties and be taking care of a loved one who has dementia. Okay, this was in the mid 2000s. It doesn't exist right now. But it could go, the check could go to you. The check could be written to a home care agency. You could use that money to pay someone to mow your lawn. And there were people who said, I'm not going to qualify for it. Or they also would say, well, I'm not going to take that sort of charity. Dementia caregiving, any caregiving is expensive. Take it when those programs come up. And guess what? If you were on the mailing list or the email distribution list for that area agency on aging, Upper Shore Aging, or the Alzheimer's Association, you were the first one to know about it. Same thing, if your loved one has congestive heart failure, get connected with the American Heart Association. If your loved one has diabetes, get connected with the local chapter of the American Diabetes Association. Get connected with, if your loved one has any kind of mental health condition, get connected with NAMI. There, there is a nonprofit for every cognitive, mental health, or physical health condition that you or your loved one might encounter. And they have a lot of free programs and low cost programs. Now, are you, now I know there's probably folks that are a little bit cynical and they're saying, $4,500 for three years, what's that gonna do? Every little bit helps. It, and, and if you are qualified for something like that, a lot of these nonprofits offer respite. So if you have a loved one going through cancer treatments, they, for example, maybe they offer rides to chemotherapy. If you have a loved one, they, you know, and that would be something you don't have to arrange, for example. <laughs> They, and if you're connected with one of those nonprofits that helps out people that has the condition that your loved one has, you're going to be the first people. Get on their mailing list, get on their email distribution list, find out what services they offer because you're going to be the first one to know about these new programs. Now, I can't promise you that something like the Rose Grant is going to come across your desk or your, your computer when you open up your email, but it might. Who knows? You won't know unless you get connected. All of these nonprofits, sure, they do research. Sure, they do uh, d different kinds of educational programs, but they do a lot of direct services that can be very cost-saving for you. So get on their websites or give them a call. If you're, if you're not somebody that loves to go online, give them a call, find out their phone numbers, and, and find out what can they do for you. Make a friend there. I always say make a friend. Get a name of the person that you're talking to, and that way, if you're ever struggling getting something or you, you find out about a service or you see a commercial for something that they're offering, Mary, you know, I know we talked a couple weeks ago. I just saw this commercial where I got this flyer in the mail. Tell me how that might apply to my situation. Get connected with the government and nonprofit organizations. And in addition to your area agency on aging, you may want to be on the radar screen of your local health department and your local department of social services. Your local Department of Social Services is not just about for folks who may need assistance with food stamps. That's not all they do. They do a lot of different things. Just get on their radar. Just give a call and say, Here, here's my situation. Is there anything that might be available to me and my loved one? Don't underestimate what nonprofit and government might be able to offer to you. And that Rose Grant, it, it just blew my mind how many people said, yeah, I'm not going to qualify. You are already qualified. I just qualified you. You just have to sign this form. And sometimes people just don't follow through. So be on the lookout and be open-minded to those types of programs that could come, come out. Elder law attorney. Elder law attorneys can save you so much money if you have any assets. So if you have a house that is worth, let's just say $100,000, seeing an elder law attorney will most likely benefit you. Why does an elder law attorney have a place in a conversation about caregiving on a budget? Yes, people probably think elder law attorney, attorneys, gosh, they're expensive. I know that they make a lot of money. Yes, they charge. They're gonna charge. They're not gonna give out free stuff like the nonprofits and the government agencies. No, that's not what they're gonna do for you. But. If you have any assets, if you have any cash, what they can do is help you make smart decisions. So you, if you ever do need medical assistance, Medicaid, which you would maybe use for adult day, which you may use for a nursing home at some point, that 
is a, they are going to provide very easy logical steps on how you can qualify more easily. So for example, one thing that they might suggest is prepaying for a funeral. We're all going to need a funeral, everybody, right? I don't want to scare anybody, but we all will die, no matter where you are in life today. So prepaying a funeral might be very uh, uh, cost effective. Might be that you upgrade the wheelchair that you're using. It might be that you start paying. Maybe your daughter says, I want to stop working to take care of you, mom. But this is really going to be a hardship for me financially. Now, if she is the CEO of a company, an elder law attorney is not going to be able to figure out a way that you can pay her to match her salary. It's, it's going to be a minimal that you can pay her, but there are legal ways that you can pay a friend or a family member to be your caregiver and that it doesn't go against if you ever have to apply for medical assistance. So I once worked with a woman who, it, this actually worked out beautifully, she was a nurse and she had a career, she really liked her job, but she really wanted to take care of her mom and even though going through an elder law attorney to create this legal agreement where she could get paid by her mom. I think she was going to get paid by her mom like $12 an hour. Something really, it wasn't going to be what she made as a nurse. But she was going to be able to stay home with her mom. She's not going to get zero. She's going to get $12 an hour. It's legal and it's not going to count against her Medicaid application someday. An elder law attorney can help you figure out those sorts of things that you can do to prepare. I have worked with countless, countless people who say, Oh my gosh, I cannot believe it. I have to sell my home and my husband doesn't need help and I, for me to ever go into a nursing home. No, you don't. Most of the time, no, you don't. You don't have to get rid of all your assets. So going, working with an elder law attorney, making the investment of paying for their services can absolutely help you save money in the long term. So. If you have any assets, now, if you make $1,000 a month on Social Security and that's it, and you don't own anything, maybe you're not a good candidate for working with an elder law attorney. But for the rest of us, you probably are. And most elder law attorneys are going to give you a 15 minute free consultation on the telephone. If you call them and just say, hey, here's my situation. Do you think I, I would benefit from meeting with you for an hour? And if you do one hour meeting and you decide it's not for you, you're only out for that one hour. But when you look at working with an elder law attorney, if you have any assets at all, and i.e. a home, it is most likely going to save you money in the long term. Now, I have two websites up here of elder law attorney databases that I think are really good. LCPLFA is the Life Care Law Firm Planning Association. And one of the things that I love about them, and most of them are certified elder law attorneys, is that they actually have a holistic life plan put together, right? So they actually have typically nurses and social workers on their staff. So they work with you looking at your, your, your life, not just your finances, not just if you're going to need Medicaid someday, but they look at your whole life plan. They offer more of a comprehensive look. And then there's NALA, which is the National Academy on Elder Law. And that's another group that you can search for an elder law attorney. I especially, anybody by the way can call themselves an elder law attorney. But a CELA is the person that is most adept at being able to provide this sort of service and understanding. They go through a lot of education to be able to do that. So now we're at E. So B-U-D-G-E, we are now at T, trial offers. In order to save money, try different services, try different programs. So for example, in our area, we're in a rural area. All these grocery stores now delivering to your home, it's so fabulous, right? Well, we don't, we miss out on that because we live over here, right? I will tell you that Amazon Fresh is offering free trials. I do not get any kickbacks from them. I certainly wish that I did. It's free, try it for a month. That can be a way that you save money in terms of getting in your car, driving to the grocery store, having somebody stay with your loved one while you do the grocery shopping. Look at it as a way of Philips Lifeline, call them. Are you offering any free month trials? If you're worried about falling, 
Anybody that lives alone and has any health issues should really consider some sort of lifeline program. In fact, Delmarva was saying that they have a program like that, one of our sponsors here, so you may want to ask them about it. I don't know if you guys offer any free trials, but you can always ask. But are there any free trials that you may like to get involved in? Always ask if you're trying something for the first time. But in addition to free trials, this isn't a free trial, but trials. If you are a person who is considering assisted living, maybe you think that that's gonna be a good match for you and or for your loved one, consider trying it out before you actually sign an agreement, before you go to the assisted living that's gonna cost X amount per month, try it as a respite, see what it's like. Now, are you gonna get the full picture are you gonna know 100% what it would be like to live there 365 days a year? No, but you're gonna get a taste for it. And so before you put down the big deposit, before you put down the big money and you sign the year long agreement or the several year agreement, consider should I take a trial? Should I try out this assisted living? Can I try out adult day before I make a big commitment? And most of the time adult day is, is usually pretty commitment free. Um, they may might make you sign up for about a month. But try trial offers. And in addition to the word trial and trial offers, I'm gonna throw out the concept of clinical trials. If you are involved with a clinical trial, and they're not for everybody, but if you have a health condition, a cognitive condition, a mental health condition, getting involved with one of those nonprofits that we talked about just before, ask them about clinical trials that you might be eligible for. It's a personal decision, but if you have a health condition, physical, mental health, or cognitive, that's the only way that we are able to find what works better for folks in terms of medicine and treatment and services. And when you enroll in trials, sometimes you receive perks like free treatment, free medicine. You don't have to pay for uh, transportation. So I'm not saying that that's for everybody, but when I use the word trial, I'm saying that in trying different products, asking for free trials, trying out products to see if they would work for the long run before you get into a long-term commitment. But then I'm also talking about clinical trials because sometimes there are major perks if you think it's the right clinical trial for you. And the best way to find out about those is to get connected with those nonprofits we just talked about. So let's pull it all together. We want to build a crew. We're going to talk about this. We're going to do an exercise in a few minutes about how to build a crew. Understand the whole financial picture. You can not start to figure out how you're going to save money or how you're going to budget better until you know exactly what you're working with. If you're saying to yourself, let's say you're not a caregiver and you're saying to yourself I need to do a better job budgeting my money I want to save maybe for a new house or I'm we're gonna have a baby and I want to save because I want to have extra cash in our savings account for when we have a child you can't do that until you know what your financial picture is you got to look at what's coming in what's going out if you're in a caregiving situation or you're an older loved one or you're the older person yourself trying to get services that get get more services you cannot start to do that and and try to figure out what makes sense for you until you have the whole financial picture don't rule out any option don't assume that you have too much money for a service that you won't qualify, that you won't, you, you can't apply for something. Don't assume until you're told outright. And also don't assume that a service or a program is too expensive for you. You just don't know. Ask questions. There's never any, there's never any harm in asking questions. All of these vendors and even all of the other services that are in our accompanying counties, they want to they want to hear your questions. If you're not financially qualified for something or you're over, you don't have enough money. If, you, if you're not financially qualified or you don't have enough money for a service, they will tell you. They're not going to play around. They're not going to say, oh, you know, maybe. They're going to be really honest with you because they don't want to waste your time and they don't want to waste their time. Don't be afraid to ask those questions. People ask those questions every day. Get connected with the nonprofits. Any health, mental health, cognitive condition you may have. Now, Alzheimer's Association, for example, if you're dealing with somebody or a loved one who has a, a, a dementia diagnosis or Alzheimer's, you can work with them. They will work with any diagnosis. But don't forget 
that if your loved one has Lewy body dementia, there's a Lewy body dementia association. Get connected with them. If your loved one has uh, Kruzfeldt Jakob disease or they have Huntington's disease, there's a nonprofit for that for the more rare dementias. There's a frontotemporal dementia association. So keep in mind that while everybody knows about the Alzheimer's Association because they've done a really good job getting their message out to the world, there are other nonprofits also for the more rare dementias. Consider consulting with, a with an elder law attorney. An elder law attorney, while it might be expensive up front, can save you so much money if you have assets. If you're, in, if you're questioning whether or not it's appropriate, just call. Again, they're going to tell you. They're not going to waste your time if you're not a good candidate. And I highly recommend CELA, C-E-L-A, after the person's name. Remember, anybody can call themselves an elder law attorney. And then finally, trials. Do trial offers. Ask for trials. If you've never tried a product or service before, consider trying out a product or service before you sign a long-term agreement. And then clinical trials. In terms of clinical trials, look at them, see if they're a good fit for you. Not only are you giving back to the healthcare community if you consider them, but often you will get free medical care, medications, and other perks. Sometimes you can even be paid for being part of a clinical trial. It's a personal decision, but something to consider. And again, you'd find out from those corresponding nonprofits to what other issue your loved one or you have. So now what we're going to do is we have a handout for everybody. And we're going to do an exercise for those who are sitting here saying, there's nobody. What you have in front of you is called the MET exercise, which is an excerpt from the book, Cruising Through Caregiving, Reducing the Stress of Caring for Your Loved One, which I wrote. This is an excerpt. You are welcome to make copies of this if you feel that it would be useful for you and your family. Today. Three minutes. We're going to give you until 10.38 to write down everything that you have on your mind that you need to do, that you need to work on, that's stressing you out. Whether it's work related, whether it's caregiving related, whether it's health related, whether it's household related, whether it's financially related. I want you to write down everything, go. I'm gonna ask you to stop with the tasks that are stressing you out list. What I'm gonna ask you to do now is at the top of that list, I want you to write, I need help with. You're gonna make another list. And this part of the list is going to be, I want you, without screening people out, write down 20 people who care about you. Hang on, I'm not done. I want you to write 20 people who care about you and I don't want you to discriminate against geography, age, how they, how they know you, why they care about you. I don't want you to be discerning. I just want you to write 20 people who care about you. It could be your brother. It could be your hairdresser. Now what we're going to do is if you are a caregiver, if you're taking care of somebody you love who's sick or has a disability, cognitive, mental health, physical condition, if you're caring for or helping care for, you have a task now. I want you to write down a list of 20 people who care about the person you are caring for. So if it's your mom, I want you to think about her friends, her hairdresser, her neighbors. If you are an older adult who is simply here because you want to learn more about how to get help for yourself, I'm going to give you a little bit harder of a task. I want you to write 10 more people down that care about you. So I'm going to give you two minutes. You are going to label and merge the two lists. So if you are a caregiver, you're taking care of a loved one, you're going to merge the list of people that care about you with the people that care about your loved one, your mom, your spouse, your grandmother, and you're going to put on top of that possible helpers. Or, if you like the boating analogy, possible crew members. You're going to put that, that 40 people, they're going to be called possible helpers. If you are an older 
person who's just, you don't have a caregiver, you're not a caregiver, but you are just making a list for yourself, you're gonna put on top of the 30 people, possible helpers. Now, once you've done that, you've got two lists. You've got your tasks that are stressing you out, and you've got your possible helpers list. What you're gonna start doing is I want you to look at how do you match up things you need help with with people on your list. Now, this is gonna take some time and energy to look at this, but does anybody have an example right now that they look and they say, you know what, there's somebody on my list that cares about me or my mom, and then there's a task that I might be able to ask them to do that they might actually be good at. Yes. So your next door neighbors care about you and they can help with rides. If they have a car, they're decent drivers, they're willing to help with rides, great. Anybody else have an example of something that, that you looked at today and you said, this is somebody that cares about us. I haven't asked them yet, but maybe I can. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. You have a friend that really likes organizing. Anybody one of those people? Jane likes that. Okay, you really, your friend loves to organize. You desperately need to downsize. You're, and she's been offering. Look at that list of people that care about you. And look at, has there been somebody on that list, people that care about you or your loved one, is there somebody on that list that you have had them say, I'll help you with organizing. Hey, I'll bring over a meal. You know what, if you need money to help out with, with something, I can contribute a little bit. Some of us get funny about a financial contribution. I always hear about the brother in Texas. So you're here on Ken Island, or you're here in Graysonville, or you're here in Centerville, or wherever you live, and I'm doing everything. My brother does nothing. He lives in Texas, he never even sees our mother. But have you ever considered asking the brother in Texas, will you contribute financially? Maybe he has money, or will you fly in once every two months to give us a little break? Don't assume that people will say no. Sometimes people are gonna surprise the heck out of you. It's like anything in life. Sometimes people are gonna disappoint you People that you really expect. One of the most heartbreaking things in caregiving is you're having a hard time helping out your husband who's had a terrible diagnosis. You're struggling and your best friend who you always thought you could rely on has done nothing, hasn't reached out, hasn't called, it's rather abandoned you. But then you got somebody from your church that has showed up and brought meals and calls so you got to be open to those miracles. You really have to be open. And yes, there's going to be people that let you down. There are going to be people on that list of people that care about you and your loved one that they're never going to do anything. You might ask them and they won't do a thing. They never will. But you might be surprised at the people that when you do finally ask how they show up for you, what they do, how far they'll go. So please, if you did this list, go back and consider it and feel free to make copies of this. Share it with others in your family if you want, it, want them to do it because there might be more hidden free resources out there than you know. If someone's willing to contribute financially, great. If someone's willing to give rides, great. If someone's willing to make a meal, great. But a lot of times people do not know what to do, much like if you have a new baby, everyone knows what to do. When you're taking care of someone who has a disability or is ill long term, people just don't know right, the right thing to do or offer. Ask. If it's someone that you've shut down before and said, oh, no, everything is fine, go back. Everything's not fine. I do need some help. And here are some of the things I'm... Maybe on your list you need to investigate. Maybe the idea of going to an elder law attorney today appealed to you. Maybe you've got a niece in another state who's great with internet skills. She can narrow down elder law attorneys that might be close to you. Th that's what I'm talking about. It doesn't necessarily have to be something huge, but it's some everybody's got stuff on their list of things that are worrying them, stressing them out. You want to look at that list of people, start matching up what you are stressed about, what you want to take off of your plate, 
and match it up with people that might be good at it. A quick trick, maybe you say, you know what, I'm seeing some obvious matches here. There are some things that I'm really, really, I really need help with. And then there's people that I'm seeing that would be really good at it. But I don't want to call them. I don't want to email them. I don't want to ask. Assign that to somebody. On that list, there is someone that you can say to your sister, to your best friend, to your neighbor, can you call these folks, let them know that I'm struggling? Can you ask them to what they might be willing to do? Give the ask to somebody else, because I'll tell you what, I am horrible at asking for myself, but you get, if I need to ask for somebody else, I'm great at that. And I bet you a lot of people on that list would be willing to make the ask for you. Great, great, the, so the trial part. So this, um, what is your name? Maris. Maris is saying um, that, the, that her organization does offer free trials, right. but also she was saying she had a really positive experience with clinical trials with her grandson. And clinical trials are a personal decision. It is not for everybody, but that's, they can offer a lot of benefits and, and save some cost saving mechanisms, but as, as well as you're exactly right, there are risks. So you always have to be aware of that too. So thank you for sharing that. You feel that they were a very good, Absolutely. worked well for you guys. Thank you so Absolutely. Thank you. Any, any other, we have time for a couple questions or we can do a wrap up. Any other one you want to ask a quick question? Um, I am going to be here. I have a couple copies of Cruising Through Caregiving if anyone would like to take a look. Um, if you give, if you email me at jen at cruisingthroughcaregiving.com, uh, you will get a free uh, chapter of the book if you'd like to take a look at that. You can do caregiving in a more cost effective way. Don't be ashamed to say that you need help from others. Whether you have, you consider yourself to be on the lower income side or you consider yourself to be very affluent, caregiving is expensive for everybody. Do not be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to seek help from the government, from nonprofits. Don't be able, afraid to ask for free trials. Don't be afraid to talk to others in your family, friend, network to tell them what you need. Don't be afraid to accept. If you're taking care of your aunt and one of your other cousins says, you know what, I'm gonna give you $500 a month to help out, don't be too proud to accept it. Accept those resources because sometimes family and friends maybe can't afford to give you their time Maybe they can't be there in person and, and help you take the, the grandma to the doctor or help her in the bathroom, but maybe they can give a little bit of money per month or a one-time donation to, so you, maybe you can use that money to do something to enhance your quality of life or theirs. Everybody in caregiving, again, unless you're Oprah, unless you were Nancy Reagan taking care of President Reagan who had the Secret Service at his house, Everybody needs a little bit of help with budgeting and caregiving. Thank you all so much.